Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the MOOC Interactomics course. In our last lecture, we learnt about the basics of diffraction based sensors from Professor Cynthia Go. Today, we will continue with our discussion on this approach with her. She will demonstrate various examples for measurement of molecular interactions using diffraction based biosensors. So, let us start by viewing an example for direct and label free measurement of anti digoxin binding to digoxin. We will talk more on the how to measure protein interactions. Welcome, Ms. Cynthia. Thank you. Okay, here I'll just show you an example. Here, here's an assay. Uh, th these are results from uh, an experiment in uh, this setup that I showed you earlier, that little prototype. Uh, so basically looking at the intensity of light as a function of time as we introduce anti-digoxin uh, to bind to digoxin which has been immobilized uh, on the glass surface. Okay. So you can see that when the analyte, uh, when the anti-digoxin is 200 micrograms per mil, uh, you get the uppermost curve. Uh, as you decrease the analyte concentration, you get the lower and lower curves until down to 200 nanograms per mil. And here on the right hand side, we blow it up so that you can see 200 ni nanograms per mil. Still pretty reasonable. I can still believe that still signal above noise but, but in there. The noise, yeah, yeah. Yes. So uh, we can go from 200 micrograms per mil to 200 nanograms per mil label free in 20 microliters of solution in this experiment. Right. I think mm -hmm. uh, that's quite good, but I think probably we can tweak it around to enhance well, the signal. So th this, is, uh, th this is still, of course, um, uh, oh, label free. this is label free. Right. It also is in that little uh, breadboard setup I showed you earlier, so uh, not, not optimized in any way. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, some of these experiments we had done earlier just on a webcam with a manual capture of, of the intensity. Right. So uh, now uh, there's many ways of pushing it higher, but one way of doing so is by putting in a label. I know this is a label-free course, but, no, but you can see what a label would do to you. So I think so, broadly we're discussing about different type of detection systems. So I think it will fit. That's right. That. So you, you remember that we have a, a, a 200 nanograms per mil that I was in the previous slide. Right. But now I'm going to introduce a secondary. Here's a secondary antibody, and in this case, uh, labeled with a little piece of gold. Actually, we found out later we don't need that gold label. But anyway, uh, for this graph that was uh, had a gold label in there, and we can bring it down from 200 nanograms per mil to 2 nanograms per mil. That's and funny. now this is now the, the this um, noise is now the noise of the detector. So we're uh, in order to go um, better than that, we have to do a little bit more of uh, signal averaging. Sure. Uh, and uh, we can do a different type of labeling, which is this is a precipitation assay. So here's our initial antigen, and then you put in the antibody, the joxin, and then you put in um, the anti, the secondary, which has uh, horseradish peroxidase in it. The horseradish peroxidase then acts on a substrate TMB to form a precipitate. Okay. If you do that, uh, we can actually go down to 50 picograms per mil. So you achieve so much higher sensitivity. From 2 nanograms, you. here's 2 nanograms per mil here, and now 2 nanograms per mil is huge, right. and we go down to 50, 50. picograms per mil. Um, I think one can actually even tweak it further, but yes, you're right. starting now to fight kinetics because uh, if you're very low, of course, you now, uh, th this binding is taking a very long period because it takes some time for them to find each other. Yeah. So, but anyway, um, just but in this... this could be useful, I think, when we are talking about very weak protein protein interactions or different type of analytes which are very, very low. That's in right. abundance. So. Yeah. So that becomes now an issue about assay development. What right. we have here is a tool that allows you to measure that signal. Now you can configure your assay so that you introduce, in this case we were just introducing them linearly, right. but in some cases you can actually 
pre-mix a cocktail and then let it uh, bind, bind together, together. and right. that may sometimes work better. Sure. So uh, it's actually not just protein that we can actually uh, look for. These are some data on uh, troponin. Uh, this is still a protein antibody uh, assay. Um, the clinically relevant level is around here, above, above this line, above two, okay. and you can see this is the signal. Uh, this is indicative of the noise of the system. That's why there's uh, you know, wiggles there, in that yeah. signal. But the interesting thing here is from the point of view of clinical diagnostics, that's 10 minutes here. Okay. So in less than five minutes, you already have a difference between uh, higher levels, clinically relevant levels, and clinically, uh, you know, absence of troponin. In a very short time, I think you're able to measure the signal right. with high intensity. That's right. So imagine that th this is a marker for, for cardiovascular disease, a marker for stroke, then you can know within a few minutes right. that it's there or not. Uh, here's an example for how you can actually assay for a couple of antibodies for, uh, for TB. Uh, here's looking at the 16 kilodaltons. So there's, uh, we've sh we're just going to show you, in this case, an example of two markers, uh, two anti antibody antigen uh, binding for TB. Um, again, it's just looking at two different spots simultaneously happening, uh, and the introduction of um, antibody to the 16 kilodalton TB antigen. Again, you start with the experiment here, and so how do you correct for the baseline in the beginning? Because I see it's beginning okay. from 800 or something. Yeah, so there, there's a baseline, oops, sorry about that. There's a baseline here because there is a diffraction pattern. We, we've put down the 16 kilo Dalton antigen uh, in, on Not the substrate. Right. And so when you shine light on it, there's going to be a baseline. Right. Okay. And um, to actually reduce non-specific binding, we put in a BSA block, and so basically here. So that's that's so that your your uh, medium will not have all the proteins sticking to the lines. Sure. So you introduce a, a BSA block. So first you do the blocking of the surface, the, and then that's right. So the here, so the signal drops to zero because of the blocking, because the uh, the BSA sticks in between the lines. Right. And then at this point, we introduce the 16 kilo Dalton. Uh, antibody for TB that will bind to the antigen. And you can see there's a little blip in here. Now, um, let me expand this area. You can see the expansion here. That blip is actually real because the Definitely. signal to noise is good enough. Yeah. But in case you basically want something that's much more obvious or something that you can see, because at this point, when you have the precipitation, you can actually see the signal already, okay? But yeah, we introduced the HRP goat anti-mouse and the TMB substrate here, and you can see the enhancement in signal, and so this is actually a very big intensity change. Uh, you can look at it, this is a 3,000, right. reading at 3,000, so it's a 3,000% uh, intensity change. Uh, no, that's I think uh, sort of clear yes or no answer, right? Th that's right, yes. So if you're trying to create a diagnostic, just say yes or yes. no, well here I can see say yes or no. Yeah, so that's one of the spots. Now, if you look at the second spot, which is, uh, which is filled with a 38 kilodalton TB antigen, uh, you can do the same experiment, uh, and then we'll put them together, right? There's two, two spots together. That's right. uh, at this point, we introduced the 16 kilodalton TB antibody, and one of the spots got more intense, the other one did not. And then at this point, we introduce the 38 kilodalton, and then you get the other spot got more intense. And yeah, then the we, we amplified them both in both spots. The no. blue one is 16 kd, and the 38 kd is the red one. And That's right. It is able to measure simultaneously both. That's right. That doesn't and if yeah. we see the signal of both, then I think we know that person is actually positive for that. Well, we, we ha you have, uh, well, TB is a very hard thing to detect, right. but at least now you know that you have two signs two that signs. it's there. And you can imagine adding, because there's other types of, uh, of potential markers for TB that we right. can just add to that. Right. And so you get more and more sure that actually something is happening. It's more sort of, I think, proof of concept which you're showing, but I think it can be applicable depending That's on right. the context. Yeah. One can make the, make the assay more robust. That's with right. the introduction of right type of proteins and more markers. Yes. Now, the other way to do that also is you can imagine making the second spot be a blank. Right. And that right. way you can make sure that the signal is, you know, in, in reference to a blank That's and, right. you know, that you don't have false, uh, false positives positive. in there. 
Okay. Uh, that we can we can skip the other ones that other than proteins, but just to show you that you can measure, look at cells, you can look at polymers, because actually the measurement of interaction is you know is general. You can measure the interaction between two types of molecules. Okay, so I think now you got a prototype, and uh, probably you can discuss that how you took the prototype and actually took it at a commercial yeah. scale because. Ultimately, yeah. you need a lot of applications to develop. Right. Well, you know, I showed you what it looked like in my lab. So, uh, you know, and I can teach you how to make one of those. Uh, but unless you want to be an expert in optics, uh, then you don't really want to have to build one every time you do a measurement. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I could have just keep cranking out data. But that's not the point, right? We want to be able to create an instrument that will be useful to other people. And if we're going to go for medical diagnostics, it's important that the instrument is functional and, uh, and useful for others. And this is the role of commercialization. So at that point, I actually, uh, around um, January 2002 or so, basically, I decided that we have to commercialize the device in order to get it to be useful by others. And uh, this is important, uh, that thing that I believe in, that for science to be able to benefit society, it has to be turned into a product that mm -hmm. others can actually use. Uh, and so this is the path of an instrument. This is how it was in my lab. And up to now, we still have these this instruments in my lab. We still work on the bench top. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we did is we translated it into a series of steps so that the current device that went out in the market late 2006, early 2007, is an instrument that other people can use. And that little piece of double-sided sticky tape, you know, it's not really going to be good for you to just have to make that yourself. It's now a little piece of plastic that's actually a lot cheaper. It took a lot to get there, but it's now uh, much more efficient and cheaper. Okay, so here's the instrument. Um, it has, it's all computerized. There's pumping system inside. There's software. And it has the little sample cell that has eight spots in it that you can put down different, uh, different proteins or different snippets of DNA or whatever biomolecule you're uh, trying to assay. So now you're assay. providing the multiplexing capability for... Yes, it has multiplexing here. Uh, instead of on top of each other, it's now in eight different spots. And effectively, in the instrument, the laser beam runs through back and forth uh, into this. And the, there's a channel there. Um, there's an insertion port, the injection port, where you inject the, uh, the analytes. Right. Uh, and it just goes to that little channel, which is about 20 microliters or less. Yep. OK. But it has a pumping system, so you can actually control the flow rate and so on, which is, becomes important when you're doing kinetic studies. So here's an example of, um, of a study on the binding of a protein to a DNA. So in this case, this is the substrate. We put down streptavidin in a pattern. And we basically uh, take that, that substrate. And here's the initial signal from that substrate. What is the y-axis here? Are you related? This is a time uh, uh, versus uh, intensity. intensity. This is just uh, intensity in uh, arbitrary units at sure. this point. Yeah. Right? So. Uh, Rec A is a protein that binds to uh, to the um, to the DNA, and that's uh, what we wanted here to see is the kinetics of binding and unbinding. Right. Um, so we start with a substrate that has only streptavidin, and when you introduce Rec A to the to that uh, sample cell, nothing happens. Right. Rec A doesn't bind. So at this point here, we introduce uh, a biotinylated oligo. And so that binds to the streptavidin, and you get a little blip and signal. Right. Okay? When you introduce REC at this point, you get a big Much increase in signal. signal. Right. Okay. And then we want to unbind REC A, so we introduce just the buffer okay. to you know, flush out the REC A, and the signal uh, goes down. That's because you know, the interaction between REC A and DNA is a lot weaker than yeah. antibody antigen interaction. And you can repeat the experiment, etc. So, and you can actually analyze these curves to measure the binding and unbinding kinetics of REC A and DNA. So, this will be similar to what we're t talking about in SPR, right? Like in terms of on rate and off rate. That's right. I think similar. Yeah, so this is an on rate and off rate of REC A onto DNA. Now, mind you know, similar both in here and in SPR, one has to actually uh, be um, put together the correct model in order to, to extract the correct uh, kinetics. Yeah. So, 
I think the softwares play a role over there, like how you best fit the model and extract right. the data for. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, I think I know that the SPR instruments come with, with associated software. Uh, now, uh, if you're actually trying to study a specific system, uh, it may or may not be the right uh, model for right. your system. In this case, you can actually write down the equations and do your own fitting of the data. So that's in order to extract real quantitative kinetics. So in this case, uh, as long as we're reasonably uh, at, at a certain range of concentration, the intensity is linear with concentration, and therefore you can can actually model the kinetics nicely. Uh, it is, this is a similar experiment, and this is on the binding of polymerase, uh, RNA polymerase, to the immobilized oligo. So show the kind of uh, different level of application one can achieve, not only as a strong antibody and uh, protein, mm -hmm. but also protein-protein or DNA protein. That's right. Or polymers or cells. Cells, yeah. So I think just, yeah. Uh, cells are actually very easy because cells are big, right? right? So, you know, as long, in fact, the challenge with cells is we have to redesign the lines because the, the lines, right, well, then the, the lines originally we have are about 1.5 microns. Okay. But you know, cells are bigger than that, and so we have to redo the whole thing with a much bigger uh, line. So different setting has to be fixed. But But it's the same principle, and yes. in fact, it's actually uh, very simple to detect cells. Sure. Yeah. So uh, this is just, um, again, th this example is antibody immunoassay, so, so you can play games on that. And what you have on this one? So, yeah, so this one's, yeah, so this is just antibody, uh, antibody quantitation and showing a slightly different surface. This is Avidin with a, with a gum FC in there. Um, it's not different from the other one, so I'll pass by it. Sure. Here, here maybe is a more interesting example, and I think this, uh, uh, this is one of the early clinical example uh, using now the instrument. As I said, now, now the fact that there is an instrument that somebody else can use, that means people can actually configure their assay and uh, play around with how you're going to get it to work best for measuring whatever it is you want to measure. That's okay? right. Uh, so this is the detection of neuron-specific enolase, which is basically associated with traumatic brain injury. And in this case, uh, so Dr. Is this kind of a marker which indicates the traumatic injury? That, that's correct, yes. And I'm not an expert on the, on the subject, sure. but uh, Dr. Berger was using this primarily to look at uh, markers in babies. When okay. you know, babies have shaken baby syndrome, they actually have issues about whether the baby has been shaken. Okay. And in this case, uh, being able to use only 20 microliters is very important because you cannot get too much blood from, from babies. Right. And so here's an example where they actually have a, um, you know, it's, it's effectively the same as we've been discussing okay. before. You, and you put down one protein that identifies another protein, and sure enough, it works. I mean, as a physical chemist, I feel like, well, if it works for one, <laughs> it has worked for if it work for another. Yes. It's a question of how strong the signal is, which is dependent on how big the, the sample is. But the challenge protein. here will be like in terms of the level of the protein, right, in the That's different uh, patients. Yeah, what, what is a significant level? So in designing uh, biodiagnostic instruments, one has to always ask, you know, if I'm detecting for disease X, what's the relevant concentration to right. detect? Right. Whether yeah. I'm able to capture the dynamic range. And That's right. Well, and, or whether it's even important to have dynamic range, okay? So if you're actually looking for a marker that's... Uh, you know, present in micromolar quantities, that's not a challenge. You can right. use anything that you have, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but also then there's no sense building an instrument that can go down to, to nanomolar if all you're detecting is micromolar. Yep. Now, for many, if, if you're interested is primarily in terms of kinetics, then uh, you don't really run kinetics at low concentration. And so, you know, you don't have to do an instrument that can do nanomolar if you're trying to actually do kinetics, because usually you run that at micromolar. So um, here's an example of uh, troponin detection. So the interesting thing here is being able to detect a complex system. So in this case, and this is the work of, uh, of Professor Jenny Van Eyck at Johns Hopkins, again using the instrument, already the commercial instrument, uh, in the surface you put down the antibody, the anti-troponin, Right. Uh, in this case, troponin is a complex that has three parts, and you can identify whether all three parts are present or in what amount are the three parts present by putting now an antibody for uh, each of the parts of troponin and measuring the response. So it's almost a multiplex assay, except for it's all on the same 
protein. protein. And uh, again, so at each point uh, here is the introduction of another thing. So uh, the introduction of the troponin and then the introduction of all the different antibodies to the different parts of it. Um, the, way they, the way we configure the instrument is actually in order to introduce a different um, solution, there's a little gas bubble. <laughs> and so this gas bubble marks where you introduce. It's a time zero. So if you're doing a kinetic measurement, you need to know exactly where time zero is, when things were introduced. I think in this case, since uh, I think they know the biology of it well, so probably uh, measuring different components was easy because I think they were able to generate anti-CTNL and anti-TNC right. and TNT fragments and then specific antibodies for it. So I think it's a pretty neat experiment where you mm -hmm. can actually measure the complex protein, but also right. its uh, individual uh, components. Yes. Yes. And so you're being able to do that and then configuring your assay because you can actually do displacements and take them away. Uh, right. Right. Um, just, and this can be done in, uh, how, how long is this? So this is um, 5,000 seconds, but it doesn't have to be even 5,000 seconds. If you're not doing kinetics, you can cut this thing shorter, right? right? right. So it doesn't have to be that long. The comparable technique is to actually do a Western blot, and you know how long Western <laughs> blots take. It will be whole yeah. and, and a lot of work and a lot of material. Right. So that was actually a very nice uh, way you can actually do experiments faster. Sure. Um, you know, there's various applications that different groups have studied, and this is about uh, detection in, in uh, PSA. And uh, some interesting work were done on antibodies uh, for isotyping and avidity experiments. So as I said, once the instrument is commercial, um, I don't even know what these things are anymore. It's I mean, measuring interactions of different biomolecules, but, and one can use the same principle. Yeah, yeah well, you, you can use the same instrument, but now you can configure your assay I to see. get you the numbers you want. Because, okay. for example, um, if I told you that um, we work best with large molecules. Well, how do you start doing small molecules? Well, you have to be more clever at it. You might have to do a displacement assay. Yeah. It's still, well, it's label-free, but you're right. going to have to do a displacement to compare the strengths of interaction. Right. In this case, you know, to look at isotyping and avidity, it's about a displacement uh, that they're doing. Same for all technology, right? Like, Th that's right. Yeah. But, but you see, uh, I personally couldn't have done all these wonderful applications. Sure. Uh, so again, I go back to, you know, the desire to benefit society by sharing your science. And it's not just about publishing it, but actually creating a device that facilitates other can, studies. Uh, give rise to multiple applications depending That's on right. what you want. And want. hopefully get it to be more useful quickly. I mean, if we can have diagnostics that are useful quickly, yes. that, that's great. Yeah. Let me just show you how we actually did multiplex. I, I kind of glossed over. I said there are eight spots in there. But to put eight different proteins on a piece of glass slide is in a pattern yeah. is actually non-trivial. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can do it by physically doing them one by one. But that becomes very, very expensive, expensive and prone to errors. Yeah. So one approach that we've actually done together uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, in collaboration with Accela, the company, is to use what's called the Beckman-Coulter A-squared linkers, which are short snippets of DNA that uh, they actually have created in order to bind to proteins, uh, but they're distinct enough so that each snippet is on one location. So for example, uh, when I bind this dark blue single-stranded oligo to the protein, it will specifically bind to this site. Right. So it will hybridize to a specific location. So it makes it a lot easier to, you know, you, you have to react your protein with this DNA, but that chemistry is known. And then you just inject them all and they go to the right locations. And so I think you can achieve more interactions simultaneously. And you can measure eight different eight, things yeah. at the same time. And that's the whole idea. So and the, the instrument works, and hopefully uh, other people will start uh, developing more. Right now, there's um, the main people using it are in uh, the diagnostics uh, area, trying to actually develop uh, ways of detecting certain uh, illnesses. But uh, it can be used for research to actually look at uh, the binding kinetics. Yes, I think now. Uh since we have developed this device, so 
now one has to think like where next right where so what to? is uh, yeah well of course the the dream um is point of care diagnostics for many right basically to be able to actually uh get yourself diagnosed without to have to, without having to have you know lots and lots of vials of blood extracted, sent to the clinic, uh, sent to some uh, laboratory and to take medicine. So if you can have diagnostics in the doctor's office, you can know quickly. That, that's a dream. Uh, there's a lot of issues uh, in it, and it's not scientific. It's a question really of, of business and policy and so on, right? Uh, so that's, that's the goal for the company. So in terms of detection systems, uh, obviously you are looking at uh, Diffraction based system here, and you're aware like the optical based system and different type of other platforms are available. Uh, what will be your perspective? Like where the field is progressing, and uh, what do you think? Like is is there a specific way one can just select a platform and move forward on it, or depending on our kind of application, one has to. No, I, I, I don't think there is one answer to everything because different different uh, devices have different strengths. Okay, so for example, what, what is the weakness for something like a diffractive optic? Uh, remember I told you there has to be repeats. Right. So therefore, we cannot detect one single molecule. Okay, so what is the best sensitivity you can achieve? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but it's certainly multiples of molecules. Right. So if you're trying to go very, very low numbers, that's not a, a way to go. Uh, so it works best. Uh, probably its main advantage is in a detection of multiplexing multi that needs multiplexing, particularly that things that needs a wide dynamic range. Okay. So for example, if you're looking at cardiac markers, some are present at nanograms, some are present at micrograms, it's very hard to find a technique that will span a very wide dynamic range. Uh, but um, there are other uh, advantages of different techniques, and one has to consider um, also the ease of use, the cost, the time right. needed, uh, etc. So sometimes we scientists tend to concentrate on signal and sensitivity, <laughs> which I still put it down. We know we want to have better signal, higher sensitivity. We, of course, want more accurate diagnostics, but then again, you know, just how accurate do you need it? I mean, basically, you know, usually when it's when you're ninety percent chance of having a disease, probably you'll get treatment for the disease. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but from the basic science perspective, uh, we would like to understand kinetics a bit better. Uh, so that there, there are models, there are um, software where you can press a button and out pops an answer, and sometimes you have to ask, well, is that really what's happening? Because once you start to de to deal with confined media, very small volumes, uh, and uh, you, you start having other issues, especially if you're, there are other things in solution that you have to take into account. Do you foresee uh, your diffraction basin in terms of integrating it with more nano elements, some nanomaterial, or uh, with the plasmons, or integrating yeah. different uh, components for having the better applications? Well, that's it. so that's one, one uh, way of improving sensitivity. So right now, we built this to be as cheap and as simple as possible. I told you, there are three elements, a light source, a sample cell, and a detector. Right. The rest rest are, you know, things that you can remove, but it's there, and that's nice for research. Uh, if you want to increase the signal, then you can put in a plasmonic surface. Actually, there are two approaches that I'm working with, with colleagues. Uh, one is uh, using uh, plasmonics uh, by having gold either on the surface or as particles or on the lines, and the other one is to actually uh, do um, elements that are vertical. Okay. to actually have confined what's called black surface waves. Again, they will make the device more expensive because it's more complex, and probably because it's more complex, it's less robust. Uh, but if you can get two orders more sensitivity, then you have a chance of looking at early stage cancer. So there's all these pluses and minuses. So I think about. that uh, application is to look for the very, very low abundant mo molecule at very early stage. <laughs> so thank you very much, Cynthia. I think uh, as you uh, learned from her lecture, uh, the science part of it, how one has to think about the even simple uh, physics principle and then build devices from it, which can be applicable for various type of application. So I'd like to thank again, uh, Cynthia, for uh, sharing your work with us and giving us a very good insight about uh, different type of detection system, including the diffraction based sensor and how one can uh, play with the different type of molecules over there and have either label free or label based detection for better sensitivity. Thank you very much. And thank you. So in these two lectures from Professor Cynthia Go, we learnt about the principle of 
diffractive optics technology, the features and advantages of this approach and application of this approach in various types of diagnostics and other biological applications. Thank you.